All right, let's have a chat with Paul Dennett. He's uh, fresh off taking home the bronze medal in the best sports podcast category at the Australian Podcast Awards as part of the Cricket Daily Podcast, and he joins us on the Overnight Crowd to talk cricket. Uh, g'day and cr- congratulations, Paul. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, it was an amazing night last night. It was probably the, the first uh, time I've been in a crowd for I don't know how long, <laughs> two years, and it was, it was a bit confronting initially and then pretty raucous. Um, I forgot what it was like to, to go out and have have a night out. Everyone seemed to be very, getting um, very well entertained. And, yeah, it was really exciting to, for us to get the bronze medal. Um, the Cricket Daily with Andrew Mansell and I, we've had a, a wonderful panel, group of co-panellists. And it's also sort of, uh, I suppose, a vindication for our, our other show, Cricket Unfiltered, with Minas and me and Jaleesa Apps have got a pretty good team together. And um, it was a lot of fun. It's a fantastic effort, mate, and well done to you both uh, for the achievement. And on behalf of a lot of people, I reckon, thanks for the efforts and the knowledge that you and the team have put into all the podcasts that you do. I mean, it's just phenomenal that we can uh, rely on this uh, every week and across a couple of days as well for free. And we just thank you so much. And uh, this award is just, yeah, such a great effort. No, it's very, very kind of you. I mean, it's very easy to prepare given that I'd be doing it anyway, but it's kind of... um... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's it's putting a it use to my hours of um of wasting time watching cricket. <laughs> That's true. Uh, to some less uh, celebratory matters, at least for myself, Paul, uh, the fifth Ashes Test looks all set to leave the shores of WA. Sydney and Melbourne both putting their hands up, and Hobart still screaming out for a test as well. Where do you think it's going to end up? Well, it's it's a moving, uh, very quickly moving thing. I had thought it was probably going to go to Melbourne, but now the reports in the papers today are that Tasmania is suddenly looming as a real chance. Um, and while I, I think on the one hand, if it went to Melbourne, it would be great if they had a, a you know day-night test match there. I'm sure the Melburnians would pack out the MCG for at least the, the first couple of nights. It would be a wonderful spectacle. Um, and if they do though send it to Hobart, then I think I admire that as well because it's kind of, um, you know, the commercial side of it probably won't make as much money in Hobart, but it would be a great occasion for, for the city of Hobart to have its first Ashes test match the, it's a lovely stadium at Belrive Oval. I'm sure that um, you know they'd pack it out with, with decent sized crowds. And Belrive Oval is roughly the size of many of the English grounds as well, so it's certainly not a, a trivial sized ground. Uh, as much as I'd love to have it in Sydney, it doesn't look like it's, it's going to happen here. And it, it is a great pity that it's not going to be in Perth. But, um, uh, great pity for um, for the people of Western Australia, but also for the Australian scene that we have a wonderful record um, in Perth. And so I'm sure England are, are pretty happy that they're not going to have to face our quicks on the on the Optus Oval deck. As collectively minded as we can all be, it feels like if it was to end up in Hobart, that's the right thing to do. I don't know if um, you know big organisations are looking for the right thing to do, but it feels like Hobart finally getting their chance is the right thing to do if it doesn't end up in Perth. Correct. I think that's right. And look, it would be... I, I remember a few years ago that actually Cricket Australia proposed to England that they wanted to make it uh, a six test series um, and that Hobart would, would get a regular get a regular gig and uh, at the time the English cricket board or English, England and Wales cricket board said no but um, it might might be nice if they have a really good uh, atmosphere and a really good test match if then that could be a, a springboard to try to um, to get that because you know as far as I'm concerned 10, t- 10 Ashes test matches every four years isn't, isn't enough it used to be um <laughs> six in England. Occasionally it used to be six in Australia. So I'd, I'd love to get a squeeze in an extra test match for the next time when they come out here. Uh, Alex Carey, he's set to take the gloves for the upcoming Ashes series. So the man enters after seemingly serving his apprenticeship amongst the white ball brigades of our cricket teams. It's a road that's led to success before, isn't it? Yeah, it certainly has. Um, I mean, the, um, in terms of going from white ball to, to red ball, David Warren is probably the, the, the spectacular example of that. First played for Australia, having never even played a Sheffield Shield game for New South Wales. Smacked 80-odd in that memorable night about 10 years ago at the MCG. And Alex Carey, um, he's such a likeable person. It's an amazing story as well that uh, it wasn't that long ago that he was playing in the inaugural season for Greater Western Sydney Giants. And to, to think that he would... Um, be the Australian wicketkeeper for an Ashes series would have seemed uh, extraordinary. But yeah, the paths that people take are, are unusual, and I, I think he's going to do an excellent job. But I think that he's the um, he's got that nice blend of being able to attack when required, but also being able to grit it out when the when the, when the situation is difficult with the bat. And so uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing how he goes. Uh, News Corp's Ben Horn today running with uh, Travis Head getting the first crack at the number five spot over Usman Khawaja as well. Is that the right decision in your mind? 
Uh, I think it's such a t- such a tight call. Uh, I probably would have gone the other way, mm. uh, but only you know fifty two forty eight kind of thing. Um, <laughs> I, I sort of expected that they were going to go with head, and I think ultimately the fact that he's what seven years younger than Kawaja is probably the determining factor. That um, there's that feeling that his longer term potential is better because of that. I, I tend to think the future is now. That um, mm. we just we've just got to pick whomever we think is the best for for this upcoming series, and I'm sure they would say that that's what they had done, but I wonder if Kawaja had been a few years younger, whether he might have got it. And I just think that um, Kawaja has been... He goes in patches. He's had, he's had some periods where his form has been irresistible, and he seems to be the right up there amongst the best batters in the world, and then he goes in um, you know, very, very lean patches as well. I think he's in a, in a pretty decent patch at the moment, and it would have been nice to see him um, get that opportunity, but Certainly can't complain with Travis Head being in the side. I was I was in England in 2019 in very difficult conditions. He was batting in the Oval uh, in, the, in at Edgbaston. Didn't score all that many, but he did look classy with the ball moving all over the shop. And so, um, yeah, you know. Um, Certainly can't complain with him being in there. <laughs> uh, within that same report from Ben Horn, uh, Mitch Stark was backed in um, for the spot as well over WA's uh, Jai Richardson. Stark averaging four wickets a test at the Gabba. Um, what would be the determining factor of Stark getting in over Richardson, do you think? I think they they do um, like to stick with their sides. And, and that is an admirable, admirable quality, that there has been a, um, a long-standing belief that you pick the players that you think are the right ones and you don't drop them lightly. And there used to be that cliche that it was harder to get out of the Australian side than, than to get into it. Mm. But I think that, you know, although I probably would have gone with Richardson for the first test, I can see why they picked Stark. And he does deserve um, uh, some loyalty because aside from a, a poor summer last summer, um, he has bowled very well for Australia. His record is excellent. And he's the sort of guy that um, he's only ever... Um, a little bit of rhythm away from being absolutely uh, dangerous and dynamic. And so I, I do think that Richardson will play a part uh, during the series and it will be interesting to see how they do shuffle the bowlers, especially given that with Pat Cummins as captain, that there'll be a reluctance to, to rotate him. But, um, you know, I, I think that Richardson will play a role at some stage and I, I think he's going to do really well. And I think he is a long-term prospect for the Australian side. I'm not sure if you uh, had the chance to see a picture of the uh, Gabba deck today. I know a lot of pictures about a week out would be looking as green as that one is, but with how green it is looking with all the weather around, is there any chance of four pace bowlers uh, being picked in the Australian side for the Gabba test? No, I like that. I like that notion. I I mean, the answer is no, I don't think so. I'd be amazed if they did. Mm. But, I, you know, um, Lyon has been a very good bowler for Australia and bowling off spin in Australian, in Australian conditions, bowling any type of spin in Australian conditions is very difficult, Mm. but you take out Shane Warne and over the last few decades, almost every spinner who has come here has been belted, whether they're an Australian spinner or an overseas spinner. I mean, Stuart McGill and Colin Miller have done pretty well, but Nathan Lyon's record is very, very fine. So, um, you can't complain with it being in the side, but if it was to be as green as as, as the, um, I haven't seen the picture, but I've heard the description of that classic <laughs> of yes, you can't you can't really determine where it is where where the um, outfield ends and the, and the actual pitch starts. Yeah. So they they do tend to stay very green in the week beforehand, and then suddenly they brown up just before the match. So I, I think we'll we'll go in with just the three quicks and the spinner. And the other thing that everyone says is when you do pick the sort of the four quicks, you end up one of them probably gets a little bit underused. So. I can't see that happening, but, you know, um, they picked, um, they're going to pick Travis Head, they're going to pick Manus Labashay, and there's a couple of decent part-time spin bowlers that could do a job. Uh, so it wouldn't be the worst decision, but it's not going to happen. Practice finally started for England today with the rain staying away long enough for the Lions to get a bat. Uh, do you hold any batting t- uh, technique concerns for England, uh, which is the usual you know, rhetoric that's running around at this time before a series with the Australian pitchers being different to the uh, touring team's pitchers? Well, I mean, this, the, the bounce is always the thing that's so difficult for overseas players to come to terms with, although English players probably find it a little bit less difficult because their wickets have a bit more bounce than maybe, say, um, places like India. So uh, I was listening to Crash Craddock um, speaking to Jared Waitley a couple of weeks ago, and he was saying that one of the, the things that's been, in his opinion, so difficult for sides coming up to the Gabba is that they 
just get to Brisbane so late before the first test, even if they've had a fair bit of decent practice throughout the rest of Australia, they get to Brisbane where they don't have um, daylight savings, just as um, few guys don't either over there in Perth. And, you know, the sun's up at five in the morning, the heat is so intense. And he said that it really is part of just the actual acclimatisation of, of living in Brisbane for a little bit of time. So even though they've had uh, very, very few opportunities there, the fact that they've been there might um, hold them in good stead. As far as their technique is concerned, I mean, the other side of it, like Rory Burns, the, their opener, whose technique is um, pulled to pieces all the time. That uh, he's a left-hander. If you freeze the, if you freeze it just at a certain point as the bowler's about to deliver, it looks like he's never played cricket before. That he's um, <laughs> his body's all at strange angles. Um, I've heard someone say that it's like it's like just as the bowler's are about to release the ball, someone's insulted his mum at mid on. He turns <laughs> his body to mid on to sort of say, "What's going on?" But then he suddenly lines up and plays it okay. He's got a first class average of about forty two, which in English conditions is an opening bat. That's pretty uh, pretty impressive. So. Um, yeah, I think that it's going to be one of the most interesting things for me is to see uh, how this England side does go in that first test match, given the, the preparation is unique and there's, there's really nothing to, to compare it to in the past. Uh, the England bowling options outside uh, Anderson and Broad, who themselves will be licking their lips about a uh, possible green top at the Gabba, themselves are both uh, still wily and, you know, but quite long in the tooth. Are there options for them uh, for England to be able to take 20 wickets, do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think that's going to be maybe the biggest determiner of uh, whether England can compete in this series or not. Uh, I think that Ollie Robinson is the the one that they are banking on being their main bowler throughout the series, that he has got an action and um, a body type that looks like it will be well suited to Australia. For me, it's going to be really interesting to see Chris Wokes. I was just looking at his figures uh, earlier today, and he averages about 22 runs per wicket in England. And it's more than double that in Australia. It's into the high 40s, um, his average in Australia. He's only played the four test matches. Uh, so, I, And basically everywhere outside England, his average is terrible. And I think that shows that he's actually... that th- Those aren't accurate. I think that he's a better bowler than that. But if he can... I mean, he, he tore Australia apart in the, the, the match that they, they beat us in, in the T20 World Cup. And I know that's a very, very different consideration. But you look at that and think, he must be the sort of guy that given a bit of life on a Gabba wicket or at the Adelaide in, in a day-night um, test match, that he'll have to be um, dangerous in Australian conditions. Craig Overton has played here before. He's a very, very handy, very, very decent bowler. And then they've got... Um, their spinner, Jack Leach, is the one who's most likely to play. He bowls um, left-arm orthodox. And again, he's another one with a pretty handy record. Average is about 26 runs per wicket in English conditions, um, which is which, which is quite good. Um, but again, it's going to be difficult because, as I said earlier, uh, not many spinners succeed down under. Yeah, the build-up is uh, yeah really starting to get to fever pitch, I think, and the uh, next few days hopefully go fast till we get to uh, day one of that first test. I'm uh, yeah a bit beside myself with uh, the wait uh, for that <laughs> first test to get underway at the moment. I'm absolutely the same. And yeah. And the sad thing is that, it, that when it starts, it then gets a, it goes so quickly yeah. that um, they cram them in back to back these days. That before you know it, um, uh, the series is all over. So I'm looking to savor every moment of it, and um, already sort of indicating to, to family and friends that um, particularly the Adelaide Test match—that's the one that you, you think that you're safe doing something in the evenings. Um, but I've had to say, look, you know, for those five days. Uh, I'm I'm off limits because I'm going to be watching the cricket. I'll have the do not disturb switched on uh, <laughs> for those five days included. Uh, the Big Bash League 11 gets underway this Sunday with the Sixers versus Stars clash to open proceedings. It's pretty hard to get a read on these teams headed in, but who do you see as the leading lights as far as teams go for this edition? Yeah, it's always difficult um, in the lead-up. I mean, I think Sixers do deserve to be favourites. They're, they're the defending champions. Uh, they've brought in Chris Jordan, uh, if their squad had any strengthening. I know that they've lost um, Brathwaite, but Chris Jordan is that sort of professional T20 bowler where the batters just can't seem to... I mean, occasionally he gets collared. He didn't have a great game in the in the World Cup semi-final, but other than that, um, I think he's a fantastic T20 bowler, and so that makes them an even better side. I think Dan Christian as well, uh, for me, um, he's had an interesting few months where he's been... Uh, in and around the Australian side, was a reserve for the World Cup and uh, had a pretty poor um, and unfortunately an unfortunate final game in the IPL. But rewind to last year in the Big Bash and he played some of the more impressive innings that I've ever seen. So I do think that they are the, the team to beat. Um, 
The Renegades are very interesting because, you know, finished last, last season. Um, I've noticed that they're tipped to come last this season as well. And um, I just don't know. I, I look at them and think um, maybe they might surprise that they, um, they have a fairly handy looking lineup. They've got um, the Afghan left arm leg spinner, Zahir Khan, who's going to be um, an interesting addition to their side. They've also got um, Unmukt Chand, who is technically the first Indian to. Um, uh, to sort of uh, play in, 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 the, in this big bash. And hopefully that'll, you'd say, will maybe convince the BCCI that they should allow some Indian players to play in pitcher, although he actually now applies his trade in the United States. So he's kind of um, no longer under the auspices of the BCCI. He was a fantastic cricketer um, about a decade ago, never really kicked on. So he'll be someone uh, interesting to watch as well. So, yeah, my tip is the Sixers, which is pretty um, stock standard, but I, I expect the Renegades to do a lot better than other people think they will. Yeah, it was fascinating that, you know, contracted or not, if you're within the BCCI uh, apparatus, you can't go and play in any of these other franchise T20 leagues. Yeah, I mean, that's the um, that's part of the dominance that they hold. And, I mean, you can sort of understand it in one way, that they want to retain the primacy of, of their own competition, but I, I just think it's misguided, even for them, that, yeah. If they um, were allowed to play in the Big Bash, I mean, the, you know, the top players that they're in a, in, a, in a test series at the moment, they they probably wouldn't come down. But those lesser lights, that, which in Indian terms, they're not really lesser lights because they're, they're such a fantastic side with such amazing depth. It would, of course, be to the Big Bash's advantage because it would suddenly draw many, many millions of eyeballs from, from India to the tournament and increase its profile and increase its um, financial clout. But it would help some of those players as well. There's, there's, there is plenty to be gained by especially young Indian players coming out and playing in a place like Perth, um, where they might one day be in the Indian test side and come up against a quick attack on Perth. And if they've never encountered those conditions before, then they're going to struggle, as everyone from India has in their first test outing in Perth, except Sachin Tendulkar. So... Um, I, I hope that they change their mind, but um, I'm not holding my breath. <laughs> <laughs> That's definitely uh, usually uh, the you know final thing that you say around anything with the BCCI involved in it. Like, will there be a women's IPL? Will they allow players to go and play elsewhere in other I, uh, T20 competitions? It's usually, I won't hold my breath. That's usually the finish of it. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> uh, do you get involved with the super coach aspect of the BBL, Paul? Good question. Um, <laughs> I, um, I haven't yet, but uh, Jaleesa Apps from, from our podcast is uh, heavily involved in it. And she has been um, goading Menas and me into doing so. So okay. I have actually set aside a bit of time tomorrow where um, I am planning to actually put in a team. Um, but I'm, um, yeah, I'm a bit nervous uh, because I think that um, Jaleesa thinks I'm going to go well and I have this sneaking <laughs> suspicion that I'm going to go really badly and I'm going to regret going in there in the, in the first place. But it's the sort of thing I think can take over your life as well. That, um, That's uh, you know, I watch the big bash games just enjoying it and relaxing and yep. not too bothered about who's going to win, but just thoroughly enjoying it. But if I've suddenly got, uh, you know, I need um, um, Sam Harper to score a 50 or something, like that, I'll be like, oh, you know, living every ball, which can make it more, even more interesting, I suppose. But yeah, so I probably will go in this year. All right, no worries. I'll uh, pass on the uh, overnight crowd uh, league code to you. It's 376438. I'll text it to you after the interview as well. But um, just for anyone listening, we're up to 37 players in our league at the moment. So it's going to be pretty hard fought. And I'm um, just getting in everyone's heads now that I've picked a pretty strong side. So I think I'm going to take it out in the first year of the overnight crowd, Big Bash League. But I am worried about that aspect of it as well, Paul, of it taking over my life. I've heard that. You're the third person that's told me that now. So really starting to think that that's a main worry I should have. Well, I'll definitely join that competition and um, see if I can get a wooden spoon in it for you. All right, no worries at all, mate. Uh, just to finish off, we'll take a quick look around some of the uh, international test cricket that's going on. India versus New Zealand. The second test got underway today, but there's another big game of who's missing from the match. Uh, Kane Williamson for the Kiwis, and you could almost name a second 11 of the names that were missing from India today as well. Yes, there's a bit of a meme going around on the um, on Twitter because Ajinkya Rahane, who was captain of the last test, and was expected to be dropped for this test match because Virat Kohli was coming back in. Um, and <laughs> I had to giggle when I saw it that they said, uh, Ajinkya Rahane is, uh, has picked up a slight hamstring strain and will be out. And so I think all the Indian fans have said, well, well done, BCC. That's a very diplomatic way of saying that he's been dropped. So, yeah, um, yeah. But that's, that's an interesting one. Um, and Jadeja for India 
uh, is another key emission. So, um, yeah, the, the latest that I saw, and again, New Zealand doing pretty well. They've taken four wickets um, and the having had to bowl first in the first test match and they ultimately got a, a very hard-fought draw with nine wickets down and then having to bowl first in this second test match, not ideal. But um, AJ Patel, the, the left arm orthodox better who took the four wickets, he's bowling actually in his hometown, the, the town that he was born in. He was born in Mumbai, um, uh, then now plays for New Zealand, so pretty nice story. But um, yeah, that, that, they've at least got themselves into that game, which is impressive again. Yeah, Pujara and uh, Coley both out for Ducks. Uh, Coley looking a bit bemused with uh, the decision, uh, with it basically getting through thanks to the umpire's call element of it. I love umpire's call um, <laughs> in the sense that I, I, I like it when it's upheld. No, I should, should clarify that because no one likes umpire's call. But I, <laughs> I, I'm, an, I'm in the opinion that they should say, if it's clipping, it's out. And so when a, when a batter gets given out and it's umpire's call and he walks off shaking his head and, and saying, you know, um, I'm, unlu- I'm unlucky. I say, yeah, you're unlucky, but it's still it's still right. I have great faith in the technology. I have much more faith in the technology than I do of a one man seeing it once from 25 metres away and basically guessing. Uh, and so as far as I'm concerned, if it's clipping, you're out in the same way that if the bowler bowls a no ball by a millimetre, it's a no ball. It's a game of fine margins and you have to draw the line somewhere. It's true. Uh, Sri Lanka today wrapping up the second test and a 2-0 uh, lead over the West Indies, winning by 164 runs. Uh, Ravish Mendes, uh, deadly out there with 5 for 66 to go with his first inning, 6 for 70, 11 across the uh, whole match for Ramish. Yes, it was a very interesting game that um, West Indies were looking uh, twice as though they were going to go quite well. In the first yeah. innings, they were... Um, uh, I was talking to my dad about it, and they were... They were um, Closing in on the Sri Lankan um, scoreline, and second goodbye to my dad, drove home, and when I arrived home, checked the score and saw that they'd lost 5 for 30 while I was on the drive. And then tonight, just as they were battling to draw the game, and with a faint hope of winning it, they only needed about four and over, and they are making a fairly good fist of it. Uh, they lost three for six, three, three wickets in six balls, <laughs> and then um, a few minutes later, did it all again, and they basically lost eight wickets in about an hour. So uh, they looked good for large stages of the game, but ultimately were pretty badly beaten in the end. It was a weird one as well. Um, the start of the Sri Lankan second innings, the first two wickets were both run outs. And I was like, oh, hang on, what's going on out here? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was thinking exactly the same thing. Uh, Pakistan versus Bangladesh. That second test gets underway tomorrow. There's a big in for Bangladesh with uh, Shakib Al-Hassan to return. We've missed him since the World Cup. Yeah, so he's a massive... Um, in, into the side, and I thought that you know, Bangladesh were a little bit disappointed with how that first test match ended because they set Pakistan ultimately 200 to win, and in in those conditions, 200 um, is never an easy task. And I thought that um, it was a very 50 line ball call as to who was to win, but Pakistan ultimately cruised to victory. They lost only two wickets, and so. Um, It'll be very interesting as to who wins the toss in this second game. If Bangladesh can um, uh, win the toss again and, and, and bat first, then I wouldn't put it past them um, really making a game of it. And, yeah, Shakib al wonderful cricketer, one of the best in the world. Any side's going to be strengthened by um, his return. Paul, well, thanks so much for the time once again, mate, and congratulations once again on the bronze medal for Best Sports Podcast at the Australian Podcast Awards. Thanks, Hader. Good on you, mate. Paul Dennett part of the Cricket Daily and also Cricket Unfiltered podcast. They're award-winning, don't you know?